All right, so so I, I'm hoping that you all remember this, or at least have heard of this, if you're too young to remember it. This is in, in 2000, this very famous paper, couple of papers came out in Nature and Science, both of them from competing groups, and it was the first, uh, the first description of the entire human genome. And that was done using sequencing, which is what we're talking about today. Uh, it was using, I guess, first generation sequencing, and today we're talking about next generation sequencing. So uh, back then, it took, they took millions of clones. They were quite long, thousands of ba base pairs. And it depends how you define finishing, but they, in nine months and for about a billion dollars, they were able to sequence the entire genome. Today, you get, instead of millions of clones like this, you get billions of short little reads, 20, 35 to 100, although that's changing now, it could be longer, base pairs, and you can do a whole genome uh, maybe in weeks and for thou tens of thousands of dollars. So the technology has changed dramatically in, in that now you can sequence much more. Um, now, we're going to talk about the technology and how it's used for other applications other than sequencing genomes. In fact, we are not going to cover that here. We're not going to talk in this class about how to assemble a genome de novo. That's what they did for the human genome, and then there's also the mouse and the fly there, also science and nature papers. So we will talk about resequencing, we will talk about using it for discovering uh, transcription factor binding sites, we'll talk about sequencing in the context of measuring DNA methylation and measuring gene expression, and also for SNP detection and genotyping. And so those are slight, there's a, those are different applications from what the original use of sequencing was, which was to sequence genomes. It's important that you see that distinction. Okay, so I'll describe the technology briefly so that everybody understands roughly how it works. Uh, so you start the whole thing starts with millions of copies of DNA, the DNA that you're interested in measuring. So this could be RNA that has been turned into DNA if you want to measure gene expression. It could be DNA that you want to resequence to find out how people are different. It could be many different things. But you start with millions of copies and you break it into little pieces. There's different ways of doing that. You can use enzymes, you can use sonication. And now you have all these little pieces of the DNA. What you want to do is sequence each one, or pieces of each one. So uh, you put it in the sequencer. You put all these bits in the sequencer. But now once you do this, the, the uh, location is now gone. There's no information about where it's coming from. You just have all these little pieces of DNA. And they're turned into reads. That's what we call them, these little reads the sequences that are read from each one of those little pieces. You don't, re you don't read the whole thing. You read the beginning or the end. I'll, I'll, I'll show a little cartoon of that later. Right, but this is, this is the raw data that most of you will be working with. It will be a, a, long, a, a, long, a very long file with basically short little sequences in it or reads. So this, is a, this is the head of the first 25 of such sequences from a particular experiment that we've been working with. Okay, so these are the platforms you have. You might have heard of Illumina. Uh, Roche has now bought 454, and then uh, Applied Biosystems is um, the makers of the solid technology. The, I, I think right now this is one, the one that dominates the scientific. Um, well, I can't point. Illumina dominates the the at least the scientific realm. But most of you probably will have Illumina. Okay, so there, this is what the, the little chips look like where, where the samples are put and then sequenced. There's eight lanes. That's the name that are given to these. these you can see the lanes of, in, in the figure. These lanes are, each one will contain a different sample that, that will be spit out to a different file. So if you have eight different samples, you could put each one on, on one on each lane. 
uh, if you're if you're assembling a whole genome or you're resequencing a genome, you'll probably use them all for one sample. You just sort of spread it out across the lane. So th the point is that that's the unit that can be easily separated out in terms of giving out files that you know where they came from. That's that's the, that's the basic uh, unit of that you can separate. If you can you can you can separate samples across. If you want to, th there are tricks where you can use. Um, you can use, what are they called? Um, uh, they use these little uh, pieces of DNA to barcode. They use barcodes, so you can put multiple samples in one lane and know where they came from. So it's a little piece of sequence that lets you know which sample it came from. That, that's one way to get multiple samples on one lane. But the easiest thing to think about is each lane will is, is, is a unit that you can get for one sample on. So from each one you get about 160 little of these little reads and um, each one from each lane. Alright, so here's a first cartoon showing how the technology works. So we start out with these we start out with DNA and now we have we break it into little pieces and these little pieces are my mouse isn't showing up. Okay, I'll have to point with my finger. So up there in the in the left corner, that is one of these these um, little DNAs that these that we want to read, and two two uh, two little two pieces of DNA are added that will bind to a solid surface. But unlike the microarray. We don't, we don't have a surface that's been split up into pieces that we know where everything is. So the, the thing will land on the, on the piece of solid, and then using these biochemistry tricks, it'll, it'll bend over and form a, um, you know, it'll form a unit, and that will then get amplified. That's, that's one of the tricks that, that, that is used, right? So this, you can see that one of the fragments lands, and once it lands, millions of copies of that fragment are made. So now this is happening all over the, the piece of solid. So here in this, in this cartoon, we have two, but you get millions and millions and millions, billions of these occurrences. Right, so you have all these pieces of DNA. They some of them fall on the, on the piece of solid, and then wherever they fall, a little cluster is formed with millions of copies of that particular piece of DNA. And those are, those are the pieces that we're going to read. All right, so then these labels are incorporated in, in a certain way. So we have, in the, in the case of Illumina, which is what I'm explaining here, each, each base is represented by a, a, a different color. So we incorporate these labels, and then images are taken. So down here you can see the images, down at the bottom right. See them down there? So each one of those little circles represents one of these clusters on the upper left hand. So millions of copies have been made. They're there. And now in the first cycle of, of the of, of, uh, processing, a, in the case of that first cluster on the right up here, on the left, sorry, you can see a, a green color. And that is associated with C. Okay, so for the first base on that fragment, in the first image that, that goes with the first base, it's a green lit up. So then we know that the first base is a C, and then um, we can keep going down the images. Right, so for the first one here, you actually read all four colors in that particular location. And you, but the highest one is green, then blue, then red, then green, then yellow, then red. And so that's where we're reading that it's a C, G, T, C, C, etc. So that, that's how the technology works. And now we, get, we come up here, and um, I don't know which one it's pointing at, but, but you, you basically get a file that has the uh, reads that we just that came up from this intensity. We have one. Two, three, four, five, six, and it keeps going down to hundreds of millions. Yeah. Question? Yeah. So 
What do you mean? Get you, is there a way to get rid of the image? Yeah. Uh, when you read, you just directly convert to letters. I mean, you don't need to necessarily to convert. How would you How would you know what letter it is? But what do, What do they do here? They have to capture an image. Yeah. Yeah. They take a picture. And then depend. So actually, they take four pictures, one for each color. And depending which is the brightest signal, that's the base that is called. And when, when all, all these signals, they don't actually read anything, right? You're not read. There's not. There's no letters to be read. It's just some mole molecule. In this case, it lights up in, in the brightest color when it when it's a C, and not some of the other. But we're, we're going to talk in another lecture, probably after this one, about base calling. How does that actually happen? Yeah, but like that case, the green and Almost equally. Here? The, uh, the third one. Yeah, the third one is hard to is going to be might be a mistake. Yeah, we have to, so they'll get a lower quality. The third one has a T and an A that are basically a tie. So we'll, you'll get a, a lower quality as, as associated with that call if things are working correctly. Yeah, so question? That that's it because there are so many atoms, right? Oh, yeah, this is just, I mean, you just took a picture. And is any M coming from like, like the situation that? You are, you are detecting two signals. I mean, you don't know which one is true, or you cannot detect any signals when they come up with that. Yeah, it's both of them happen. So uh, as we'll learn later today, we will see that as as this whole process goes on, it becomes worse and worse. And therefore, it's it's going to be harder and harder to make calls. Okay, so we this is what we talked about earlier. There's a, there's many different applications that you can you can do with this it's resequencing, SNP discovery and genotyping, variant discovery, transcription factor binding sites measurement and discovery, gene expression measurements and uh, methylation. These are examples. There's even more than this. But it's just not it's not just assembly. And in fact, we are actually not talking about assembly here because that is more of a computer science problem than a statistical problem. Okay, so because of all these uh, applications that, that, that sequencing offers, and they, they tend to be the same, a lot of them are the ones, are the, are the same ones that microarrays are supposed to be uh, solving, you get, you, you know, you, 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 we got uh, editorials like this published when the, when the technology first came out. Now, the, the, uh, the what people were thinking was that because there's no hybridization, it's all nice clean sequence, then none of the problems that microarrays have will be present in sequencing. Now that we actually have seen data, we have realized that that's not the case, that a lot of the same issues come up. There's a lot of biases, systematic errors, and therefore today there's still a lot of people that for things like gene expression and um, even for genotyping are still using microarrays and certainly for methylation measurement I'd say the most used tool right now is, is a microarray, it's a four, called the Illumina 450K array and it might be true that microarrays will die someday but it's not, it's not definitely wasn't in 2008 and it, I don't think it's 2012 either so some, some of the things we're going to talk about here are all these issues data issues with, with the, with the uh, sequencing data Okay, so you have heard of, you, some of you might have heard of things like the Thousand Genomes Project. The Thousand Genomes Project is just like the, the first genome project where they did one individual, which was really a mixture of five or six individuals. Now they're, they're, they're doing th thousands of individuals. They want to get the whole genomes for them and then do compar comparisons, find small, rare variants, so things like that. Uh, there's also the Human Epigenome Project. They're, they're using a lot of sequencing for doing things like chip seek and um, some methods for measuring methylation. All these projects are basically using sequencing data. Okay, well, so now uh, let's talk a little bit about how us as data analysts deal with this. So the data will come to you in a file, in a file like that will basically contain sequences like this. It's a little bit more complicated because it also includes qualities, quality calls for each call. But it's essentially 
something like this. So, um, in most applications, the first thing we're going to want to do is find out each read where from the genome did it come from. So if it's a if it's a problem where you're trying if it, if your application is SNP detection or SNP calling, and you have you have a piece of sequence. What information do you get from that piece of sequence? Well, if it once you know where it maps to, you can check to see if at a specific site, it's giving you a different call, a different base than the reference genome, therefore giving you evidence that it's maybe a new variant, a SNP, or, or if it is a known variant that you have a different genotype. So typically, that's the first step. So you have, you have all the, the, these sequences that I just showed you er, in the previous figure were actually all coming from, I had already organized it so that they all come from the, roughly the same location, and there you can see how they're mapping like this, this first one down at the bottom, you see it mapping to the genome perfectly. And then this one maps he here, etc. So they all have been mapped to the genome. Okay, so now once you do that, th that's a that's the first step. We're gonna I'm gonna have a lecture on, on alignment. That's what we call that step. It's uh, somewhat complicated, and it and the, the tools that existed previously don't work. You have to use some new software like Bowtie is the one that we'll be talking about in class. Um, but once you've done that, let's assume for now that you have already aligned your sequences, then what, what is it good for? What do you do with that? So here's one example. Let's say you're, you're asking yourself, at that location where, where the arrow is pointing, is that a variant? Do humans change from in that location? Or is everybody the same? So right now I only have one sample. So what is my what is my chances of seeing that, that discovering that that's a SNP or a, or, a, or a rare variant? What would I have to see when I map the, the, the sequences there? Go ahead. Yeah, another base, right? Oh, wrong way. So we have we align these things and we look right so there's g it, it's supposed to be g but this particular person has a has a's g's there's a c in there and there's, there's a few a's and g's so what would you say you're just looking at that this person all these sequences come from the same person what would you say about that that particular person at that site that it's a heterozygous right and it's um, it's, if, that, if that wasn't previously known, then we, we have evidence that that is, in fact, a location where humans vary, and this person had one, um, had a mom or a dad that instead of a G had an A. Okay, so that's how we could discover um, new variants. Now, notice there's a C. What do you think that C is? Huh? It's an it's a error. So there are errors, as we will see later in these reads. It's off. It's the, the error rate is there's claims when you get, when you when you go and buy a product, they're going to give you an error rate, but that's usually not the real error rate. It's going to be a little bit higher. Number one, because you're not as good as them at using their machines, and second, because um, well, I was going to say something that might get me uh, in trouble. So I'll just say that at the end. Uh, at the, towards the end of the reads, we, we tend to see more errors than at the beginning. So even if an, on overall there's a very small rate, there are places in the reads where you, see, where you can see a lot of errors and that can confuse you. We'll, we're going to see that a little later. So the point is that if you want to know if that is a variant, if you only had, if only one base, if only one read landed there, you, would you be able to discover this? No way, right? If you, why? Let's say one base lands, if it's a heterozygous, first of all, there's a 50-50 chance that the one that will land there is actually the same one. So you don't discover it. So you at least would, you know, need a few to ensure that you get the A that, 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 that is new. But even if, you have, even if you have enough to get that, then what about if you saw GA? What if you only saw the first two? Would we, would, we, would, would we be confident enough to say, oh, that's a SNP? No, because A could be an error. 
So you need what, what, what in, in, this, in this research area, we call it coverage. You need, a, you need quite a bit of coverage for this exercise. You know, people are saying 20x, 30x. That means that on average, at each location, you about 20 reads land. And that's when you are going to start feeling comfortable making calls. So that means it's not as cheap as it was first described to do like a resequencing project. Uh, you need, if everything were perfect and there were no errors in the reads, you would need much less. But because there are errors, you need more coverage to make sure that you, what you're seeing is really not an error. And that means that we need uh, quite, a, quite, a, quite a lot of coverage and ma it makes it somewhat more expensive than we thought it was. So things like the 1,000 Genomes Project, they shifted from doing 1,000 genomes to doing 1,000 exomes. Right? So instead of doing every, every single base, they just decided to do the exomes and therefore could make it cheaper. Although now, now they are doing the whole genome for some people, but the idea of doing a thousand genomes, they either do it at a really low coverage or they, or they did exomes. Yeah. So, so, so the depth and coverage are, are basically synonyms. Okay, so there, there. Oops, I should have done this here earlier. So that looks like it's a heterozygous, and it's a genotype is, is is a is a gene. And that's the, so. There, by the way, there's that's the definition of coverage is at that at that base the coverage is, you count how many reads fell there. Oh yeah. So the dash in this case is that the read is actually G A C A C C C T A. This is this is a standard uh, nomenclature from the from the alignment research community. So the dash means that th there's nothing there. It's just G A C A, but you need the dash to make it map to the genome. So the human geneticist in the room, what is that then? What, what does that look like? A deletion from the sample we're looking at. So the sample we're looking at seems to have a base missing as compared to the reference. So when you, it's not an error. It's not that it, well, it could be an error, but it probably isn't. It's more likely that this person actually has a deletion. So when you align, you have to be aware of these possibilities. Makes that, makes it harder. Okay, so that's very quick intro to variant calling, we should have a lecture on that, just that subject. Uh, next application is gene expression. RNA sequencing is what it's called, RNA-seq. For example, we might ask, we have two samples and we might ask, are these two, is this gene differentially expressed in these two samples? So how do you do, how do you use sequencing to do that? So like I said earlier, there's a trick for turning RNA into a DNA that you can sequence on the machine. So you, you have your sample just like the sample you would put on a microarray, but now we turn it into something we can sequence, we sequence it, and now the question is, this gene, how expressed was it? So if that gene was expressed, it, mean, it means there was a lot of transcripts of that gene, and if we converted the D, that RNA into DNA, a lot of reads should fall on that location. So we start with the reads just like we did before. Now we align, we align them maybe just to the genes, although it, what we find is that it's better to just align to the whole genome. But you could just align to the genes. Right? So you have on the first sample, you have all these reads aligning to that gene. On the second sample, you just have a few, and now you say, oh, that's you know, differentially expressed. Because right? there's more aligning up there than down here. Now, there's a lot more to be done here. This is, uh, this is not really how it happens in, in, in practice. It's not this simple. There's things like um, we do have to take into account bi biological variability just like before and, and perform tests. This is just one versus one. We don't know if this is just this difference is random variability. That p-value 
I'm not sure how, I got, how we got it because there's only one sample, but I put it there because some of the existing software will just spit out some p-value, even if it's one versus one. I think it's, it's a model assuming that the two things are Poisson processes, and this is the p-value of the same Poisson processing process producing three counts on one and whatever that is, you know, 20, 10, 15 counts on the other. But that is not accounting for biological variability. So if we collect 20 samples of each group, maybe we will see that in one group you see the variability going from 3 to 30 to 20 to 15, and then it turns out that this gene isn't in fact differentially expressed at the population level. So the other thing that we will uh, learn about is that you, with this technology, it's it's possible to detect alternative splicing and new genes, alternative start sites, all kinds of different such things, and we will have a lecture that describes how to do that. It's much more complicated. And that's most of the papers you read these days in this particular data is about that. Okay, chip seek. So now what, are, now what is the goal for this application? We want to know where a specific transcription factor binds to the DNA. So with, with this chip approach, we have a, bio, a biochemical way to, to separate out the pieces of DNA that have this, a specific protein. I'm going to draw on the board real quick. So you have, you have DNA, and you have certain locations where, where pro, a, a specific protein you're interested in binds. So what you do is you break the DNA into pieces, and then you actually have that protein bind. I'm sorry, and then you have an antibody that will grab the parts of the DNA that have that, where the protein has bind has has is 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 binding. So now the the pieces where you have, um, yeah, the pieces where you do have the DNA, where where you have the binding stay, and all the other ones don't stay. Okay, so what you're left is it is a enriched version of your original DNA where only the pieces where the where the protein is bound stay in the sample. And you, usually that is a small percent of the genome. So you end up with a tiny little bit of DNA. So now the question is, what part of the DNA did this happen at? Right? This is something that's happening in, in a, in a um, where does it happen? In a beaker? Do you know where chip happens? Is a test tube? In a test tube. Huh? Oh, yeah, okay. So... But we can't. We don't know where it is. We don't know what DNA this is, and that's where the sequencing comes in, because we know we have these pieces of DNA. We have them, and now we want to know which which pieces are they, right? So we sequence them, and now we know there they are. And now what we do is we we look we look where they mapped it on the reference, and typically what you get is locations on the genome where reads align. Sometimes a lot of them, and that's probably where the transcription factor binding sites are aligned. So we then have a step called peak detection, and we'll have a lecture on that as well, um, that deals with finding where these locations are. And I would say that ChIP-seq has in fact killed the microarray alternative. The ChIP-chip uh, technology I think is no longer going to be used because ChIP-seq is, is in fact much better, much cleaner, and actually just as easy to analyze. So how confident can you be that the alignment is true given that transcription factor binding sites tend to be so short? Right, so, okay, so, um, so what's going to happen is that the pieces are going to, are going to, the pieces you're reading are bigger include the transcription factor binding sites, right? So the transcription factor binding site will be somewhere in here and all these pieces contain it. So at the end you're going to get like a triangle shape and you can you can 
try to infer where in precisely is it that the transcription factor binding site is. It's usually at the middle of this peak. But yeah, we'll have a lecture explaining that. Okay, so, um, to, so I'm gonna today we're gonna also have a uh, lecture on base calling and some of the problems with the with the reads. So, oh, sorry. Before we do that, let's just talk a little bit about align, alignment. So, this is if you're gonna match ten million reads, which is typical, and this is the old technology with 32 base pairs read. Blast is going to take months, and so is Blat. These are the these are the ex the existing tools. When I first got my my first data set, were that's what I first thought of Blast Blat. Um, I, I mean, I'm not much of an expert in this. I also try to write my own in Perl, but that was going to take two centuries. <laughs> so uh, that this clearly this problem was a little too hard for for me and for existing tools. So that's when. Uh, of course, computer scientists came in and, and came up with new tricks for short reads. So BLAST and BLAT aren't really meant for the case where you have thousands, in this case, millions of sequences. It's meant for one, right? You give it one, and it tells you where it is. And the, the uh, exi other existing alignment programs were meant for longer reads, not, short, not many short reads. So those took, you know, they weren't, they weren't the right tool for this problem. Now, the first tool I saw come out was something called MAC. Uh, that was not, it was fast, not much faster, not as fast as something I saw come out a little later, which is Bowtie. And we're going to have uh, Ben Langme, the author of Bowtie, come give a lecture on how it works. That one it was first really ultra fast algorithm for, for alignment. There's and, Bowtie 2. Huh? There's Bowtie 2 now, yeah. But that's not, that's not how, that really doesn't improve speed, it, it improves other aspects of it. So there's the, the, the website for Bowtie, but um, that's, so what is Bowtie doing? So we have basically a read, it's up here at the top, and then we have the human genome, which is three billion base pairs. And we are looking, we have to look through the entire genome and find where is that sequence, so that you can see why that's a um, difficult problem, but there's these computer science tricks that seem al almost magical that make it possible to do this in you know a million of these in, in minutes it's quite amazing but one of the harder steps in the whole process is distinguishing between two locations where it does look like it matches pretty well All right, so here's here are the two possible matches you can see that they 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 match pretty well and there's just all this um, work that has been done for evaluating alignments there's like the Smith Waterman and all these other things. So you we have to form some kind of score to decide which of these two is better. So that's one of some one of the things that these alignment algorithms have to do. And one thing I should mention is that the the quality of the each one of these bases comes with a quality that is assigned to it from the from the manufacturer. And if you get an error, a mismatch at a base that has low quality, you will give it a less weight than if you see a mismatch at a, um, uh, at, at a, a good quality call. Okay, so that's the end of the introduction.